Well, Melinda, thanks. Uh, Melinda, thanks very much for that. Uh, I really appreciate that and certainly a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak to a group of you all sort of all distributed over the world, you know, through Zoom like this and uh, uh, particularly with such a group interested in uh, perspectives on climate science, which is certainly of great interest to me as well. So let's see, let me share my screen with you and we'll go to see there. Okay, does that look okay? Great. So um, uh, I'd like to tell you uh, today about, about work we've been doing on, on sea ice, namely frozen seawater, and uh, the role that it plays in our, in our climate system. And in particular, I'll be telling you a lot about the mathematics of this, but at the end, I'll tell you about sort of the, the other side of the field science and actually going down there or up there and uh, measuring the properties that I'm going to be uh, talking about today. Um, already, now this is actually melting, what you're looking at is melting Arctic sea ice and already you see uh, some very beautiful geometry and that's one of the things we'll focus on later, uh, later in the talk. So why study sea ice? Well, there's, it's melting, but there's still a lot of it. It covers roughly 12% uh, of the Earth's ocean surface. It forms uh, the very thin frozen boundary between the, uh, uh, the two principal geophysical fluids on the Earth and the ocean and the atmosphere. And as such, it mediates the exchange of heat, uh, gases, and momentum. Here, this is, the, this is the ship that you'll see in the video. This is the Aurora Australis, uh, the main um, uh, Australian research icebreaker. And uh, this is the, this lead or opening in the ice being created by uh, the ship's track. And you see heat rising up, being transferred from the ocean, the warmer ocean below to the colder atmosphere. Uh, both the freezing and the melting of sea ice play an important role in global ocean circulation. And it's one of the main ways that uh, the polar regions communicates with the rest of the world's ocean system, as well as the climate system. Um, as you'll see, uh, sea ice uh, hosts a very rich ecosystem um, from viruses and bacteria and algae all the way up to the top predators, polar bears and leopard seals and killer whales that we all know. Um, and as this very thin, uh, thin, in other words, one to two to three, a few meters, as this very thin frozen boundary layer, uh, sea ice is, uh, is a sensitive indicator of our, of our changing climate. One of the main jobs that sea ice plays is in reflecting incoming solar radiation during the polar summer. This is measured by the albedo, where uh, the ratio of reflected sunlight to incident sunlight, uh, whereas white snow and ice reflect most of the incoming solar radiation, seawater or meltwater sitting on the surface of melting Arctic sea ice absorb most of that incoming radiation. And so if you start to lose this white reflective surface, and it's replaced by a darker absorptive surface, well, then you start to absorb even more, uh, absorb even more thermal energy. And of course, that's the issue, is that we are losing the summer Arctic ice pack when the sun is shining at sort of a, a, a quite a dramatic rate. So this is the September minimum at the end of the melt season. And so uh, before the turn of the millennium, uh, the average, certainly the average was around uh, 7 million square kilometers at the end of the summer, but then we started to see this precipitous decline um, around the turn of the century or the turn of the millennium. Um, it, this started making the news in 2007 um, when there was an initial sort of really a very significant drop. Um, we, we made a record low where we went from say the average of uh, 7 million to down to less than three and a half million. So you can make the rather dramatic statement that we've we're in the range now, we, bat, we bounced back, but now we're pretty close back down there again, where we lost over or about half of the summer Arctic sea ice pack. Um, not over uh, millions of years or millennia, but over the past uh, couple of decades. To put this in some geographical perspective, then um, this was this median extent before the, uh, sort of over the, the early part of the satellite era. Here's kind of where we are now. Um, actually, this was of last uh, last September, the last min we had. Um, by the way, you see this you see this hole right there, and that's a that's an inherent data gap in the way satellites work. And 
we've actually uh, developed some interesting uh, partial differential equation methods to, to try to fill that in. Um, it used to be the case that, well, it's just all ice, right? You know, it's the North Pole, but it's just not, it's not the case anymore. And so anyway, that'll be one of the interesting inverse problems that we'll sort of talk about. So predicting, you know, what may come next, be it the most likely we get to ice-free summers some point down the road, the pack stabilizes or we get recovery. Um, this all requires a lot of mathematical modeling. And so from a, so let you kind of know what was going on, say, say you know, five, 10 years ago that motivated a lot of what we have been involved in and what other theoreticians have been involved in. And, and that is from the, from the point of view of the, let's say the world's 20 best climate models. And this was the, uh, from IPCC, um, the, the, well, the fourth assessment, but there was a similar picture um, uh, a little bit later on as well. And that is, they all, they all predict a general decline of summer Arctic sea ice over the 21st century. However, um, the data, uh, the ice was melting a lot. You see in the data that the ice was melting a lot more rapidly than was being predicted. And so this sets up a challenge. How do we represent sea ice more realistically in climate models, ultimately to in big global climate models to improve uh, uh, projections of the ice pack? Um, for example, or how do we account for, for very important processes that do affect ultimately rates of melting, such as uh, melt ponds sitting on the surface? Because if you're not accounting for these, well, you're, you're way off on your albedo, which means you're off on your melting rates and so on. And there was an early paper by some of my friends and colleagues um, uh, showing that this is from a mathematical, in mathematical language, including ponds in simulations is not an order epsilon effect. It's like 40%. It's, you know, it's a, a dominant important thing that needs to be included. And you know, in a second, I'll be talking about submillimeter scale brine inclusions. They turn out to be really important in. Um, influencing uh, what's happening in the climate system on much larger scales. And so there's a whole host of subgrid scale structures and processes that are critical for understanding the role of sea ice in climate and that we need to kind of incorporate and get a better handle on. So this is certainly very challenging um, uh, for sea ice as it is a complex multi-scale composite material which exhibits interesting structure over length scales ranging from submillimeters, 10 orders of magnitude up to hundreds of hundreds of kilometers across the Arctic Ocean. So this is the, the I mean, you freeze seawater, you can't incorporate salt into the crystalline structure. So you get these, what's left over is these fluid inclusions, very salty fluid inclusions. Um, and their geometry, volume fraction, and connectivity uh, depend dramatically on small changes in temperature. But also, it's ice, it's a polycrystalline material, and the polycrystalline structure can depend strongly on um, uh, the conditions under which the ice was grown. These tiny brine inclusions can connect up to form much larger channels through which fluid can flow over large um, uh, length scales, at least on the, on the size of the sample sea ice. Um, and then sort of on the meso scale now, um, moving up in scale, these melt ponds or Antarctic pressure ridges or Arctic pressure ridges, which can last for miles or whatever. And then on the real macro scale, we see, and this will be an important point of view, that um, the ice pack itself is a, um, is a multi-scale composite, hierarchical, fractally type of um, composite, granular composite of ice flows in a, in a seawater host. Now, when you're, deal when you're dealing with composite materials, one of the main questions is, and a very interesting and deep uh, question that for is formulated in the mathematics literature, in the physics literature, the engineering literature, the geophysics literature, dot, dot, dot. And that's the question of homogenization. What's the effective behavior? You know, information about the microstructure, say, of uh, conducting inclusions in a in, a, in, a, in, in an insulating host. And, um, and so then you ask, the, the forward problem is given information about the microstructure, what's the effective behavior? Like if it's conductivity, what's the effective conductivity of this composite on much measured on much larger scales? 
And then the inverse problem, also of great interest, particularly in geophysics and medicine and so on, is given uh, 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 measurements of the bulk properties of a material, how do you invert for what is going on inside? What's inside the black box? What are the microstructural details? And these problems, it's probably not known so widely, but these problems have a very famous history going back to even Maxwell and Einstein, who worked on the so-called dilute limits, like Einstein worked on the effective viscosity of a dilute suspension of rigid spheres in a fluid, which is mathematically similar to the effective conductivity of a dilute suspension of conducting spheres um, in, say, an insulating host. And then there were a lot of advancements, say, in the, in the, uh, the 20th century, certainly. And in fact, at, at the University of Utah, we, in the early 90s, we built up a really big group in this, in this kind of um, uh, 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 applied mathematics. And um, anyway, but overall, uh, the widespread use of composite materials in the late 20th century was certainly due in large part to getting beyond trial and error in a laboratory to making major advances in mathematically predicting um, the effective properties. Okay. So what's so you know what's our research? What's our what's this talk about? Um, essentially, how we're using methods of homogenization and statistical physics to model sea ice effective behavior and ultimately advance how we're representing sea ice in climate models and in process studies and so on. And we have lots of different studies and investigations going on on the micro scale, the meso scale, the macro scale. And so we're going to kind of take a tour of all these these processes and what, but we're mathematicians. And what sort of distinguishes the way we look at this and the methods that we bring to bear are, if, hey, if the mathematics fits, you know, we wear it. So there are lots of different kinds of, um, of, uh, of, of areas of science and engineering and applied mathematics that we tap into to bring, to, to, to bring methods to bear on CI, such as electrical engineering, the technology of stealth materials and evasion from radar, uh, porous media, oil extraction, which has now morphed into uh, carbon sequestration. Um, I am uh, did my postdoc, as some of you know, did my postdoc at Rutgers with Joel Leibowitz and the whole StatMet group there. So very close to my heart is the statistical mechanics of ferromagnets and those kinds of those kinds of approaches, such as Anderson localization and semiconductor physics, random matrix theory. Uh, differential equations, stochastic processes, the whole host of complex analysis, functional analysis, there's a whole host of different um, areas that we tap into to, uh, to study uh, sea ice. And consequently, there's a lot of different areas that our, that our work impacts. Of course, climate modeling and the biology and physics of sea ice, but also you know, general theorems and models of composite materials, polycrystalline media, so on, a lot of uh, uh, our work impacts on remote sensing, um, advection diffusion processes where you're diffusing, but you're in a, in a, in a, uh, a forcing or an advective flow field or something. Also, um, our work impacts biomedical imaging, biomaterials, uh, these extracellular polymeric substances that I'll, that I'll mention and so on. And even we're getting very involved lately in polar microbial ecology and employing our uh, knowledge of the physics of the microstructure and how does that impact the life that lives there. Okay, and one of the key ideas, again, that, that gets to the heart of the mathematics is what I like to call cross-pollination, where we take ideas from, as you can see, seemingly unrelated areas of science and engineering and bring them to bear on sea ice, and then take ideas and things that we uh, study for sea ice and apply it uh, to all these other areas, such as um, as you'll see, uh, the math our mathematical characterizations of the conductivity of the brine microstructure, and what does that tell us about monitoring osteoporosis in human bone? To us, it's the same problem. Okay, so how do these scales um, link up? Because um, again, this is fundamentally a, a, a complex multi-scale problem. So the the the, the, the sub-millimeter scale brine inclusions. Um, uh, into the, their, the permeability of the ice interacts with the topography, the snow topography, to create the shapes and the geometry of how meltwater is distributed on sea ice as it melts in the late spring and summer. And then upscaling that, we're interested in the overall albedo, and then, you know, then a global or polar 
kind of, uh, say, calculation of albedo that ultimately goes into uh, climate models. So, okay, let's focus on the micro scale. So before we got involved in this, um, people were, I guess, sea ice scientists were taking slices of sea ice and then taking photos and so on. But anyway, we developed the first X-ray tomography method to actually mathematically and digitally analyze the, the brine microstructure. And um, so here you see how dramatically, so, and in fact, you see no pathways, one pathway and many pathways as the temperature increases. And so fluid flow through the porous microstructure of sea ice um, is critical for both the climatology of sea ice, but also the biology. So whether or not these ponds, for example, um, uh, grow or drain overnight, completely changing the albedo, uh, depends upon the fluid permeability, how easy it is for fluid to flow through the sea ice below. And then there's all these algae that live inside the sea ice. This is one of the most fascinating aspects of sea ice. It's, an, it's this incredible ecosystem in itself because of these fluid inclusions. And, um, uh, and the way these, uh, nutrient, the, these algae get their nutrients is through, uh, through seawater percolating through it. And there's a lot of other very important processes such as snow ice formation on the surface of Antarctic sea ice that all is mediated by fluid flow through the porous microstructure. So we're interested in the fluid permeability of a porous medium uh, described by Darcy's law. Um, where you have the average fluid velocity is related to the pressure gradient through what I would call a uh, fluid conductivity, where the denominator is the viscosity. The more viscous the fluid is, the less, you know, the harder it is to push through the, the porous medium. And then the main thing, the homogenized parameter, is the um, uh, effective fluid permeability tensor, which can, of course, be different in different directions, which you have in sea ice, because there's generally a vertical anisotropy in the brine microstructure. And so one of the key aspects of sea ice that really makes it fascinating is, and one of, one of the things that basically I, I discovered out on the ice, well, there were some antecedents of this in the literature, but um, uh, I was out uh, in the middle of a big storm um, in, in 1994, uh, in our summertime, in the Antarctic, the Antarctic winter, and I saw a fluid just percolating and flooding the surface. And I had studied the microstructure of sea ice. And anyway, it was warming up. We were in a big storm. And I realized that I was witnessing a percolation threshold, effectively an on-off switch for fluid flow through vertical fluid flow uh, through, uh, through sea ice. And so, um, so roughly speaking, for brine volume fractions below about 5% in so-called columnar standard congelation grown ice and sea ice in quiescent conditions, the sea ice is effectively impermeable. For brine volume fractions above 5%, um, it's, uh, it's permeable and increasingly so with increasing temperature or brine volume fraction. Um, and uh, this critical brine volume fraction of about 5% corresponds to a critical temperature of about minus five Celsius for a bulk salinity of about five parts per thousand. And this has become known as the, the rule of fives, sort of a rule of thumb for bulk transport of fluid. And um, that night when I was out on the ice, I, I realized that it was a, took, took many, many years to actually confirm this, but I realized that it was a percolation threshold. I just spent 10 years divorced from the, I started studying sea ice in high school at NASA and then in college, studying electromagnetic wave propagation in sea ice to measure its thickness, which is now a very important problem. And then, I, and then the intent was to leave the sea ice world and become a mathematical physicist. And I got my PhD in mathematics and but studied the mathematics of composite materials. Um, but, uh, but anyway, and then I went to Rutgers for, to study mathematical physics. And then I was assistant professor at Princeton, again, studying pure percolation theory and phase transitions and what mathematical physicists do, that kind of stuff. And then I was, and then like a couple of years later, I find myself out on the ice in the middle of Antarctica, in the, you know, in the middle of a massive storm. And I kind of realized that what I had been doing for the last 10 years as a mathematical physicist, like, oh my goodness, this is percolation theory in action right in front of my eyes. As I watched this, it wasn't like a, a fountain of brine, but you know, but it, I knew what was going on though. And anyway, and in that instant, I realized, oh, it's a percolation threshold. 
However, this is classic percolation theory. You have a, a 2D lattice um, uh, uh, in two dimensions, a square, square lattice. Um, here's about a third of them are filled and you're in an impermeable state. Fluid or electricity tries to get through there, but it can't. However, two thirds of them filled, okay, it might be a tortuous pathway, but in an infinite lattice, there's an, there, there exists an infinite cluster. But then the question is, well, what's the smallest value of P for which you have the existence of an infinite open cluster through which fluid or electricity can flow? And that's exactly one half or 50% for this 2D square bond lattice. Okay, but now you're way off. Now you're an order of magnitude off. So that presented a fundamental mystery. Like, okay, what am I missing? I know it's a percolation threshold, but why is it so low in sea ice? And so what I realized was that there's a, 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 an excluded volume effect where the brine is not, you know, randomly distributed like a, like a, you know, independent Bernoulli trials. You know, that'd be nice, but of course it's not. And, and so there's a segregated, uh, uh, um, segregated volume effect where, where the, the, the brine lives on, the, on the, 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 the grain boundaries between the pure ice platelets, which turns out then I recall through my material science background in graduate school, I guess, um, that, that um, this is very similar to what are called compressed powder microstructures, big polymer spheres, little um, carbon black or silver particles. And so you can, so with very, and they were expensive. So they, so you, so you could, you could get 35, 40% silver particles in a, in a, in a polymer host and achieve connectivity of the conducting phase, which then gives you radar absorbing capabilities, but it's too expensive. So they came up with this compressed powder microstructure. So you, you reduce it down, so you can get arbitrarily small, arbitrarily small percolation thresholds, uh, uh, volume fractions required of your expensive conducting phase to still achieve radar absorbing capabilities. So these materials were used in the development of stealthy uh, uh, aircraft to evade radar. And I just realized that, oh, well, they developed a, a continuum percolation theory to predict the critical volume fraction as a function of the ratio of the radii of the two different particles. So all I did was I took this photo, I unsquashed it, and then I took about five measurements, and then it was like, oh, and then I plugged it into their formula and out popped 5%. So anyway, that was sort of very fortuitous and amazing. And, but that explained all kinds of uh, data that we had on ice production and algal growth and so on. And by the way, that means that sea ice itself is radar absorbing. That's why sea ice, you'll hear in the video, sea ice is referred to as the, one of the holy, the thickness of the ice is one of the holy grails of climate science because the radar waves from normal satellites don't prop, they, they, they get absorbed like stealthy aircraft. So sea ice is stealthy. That's one of the reasons why it's difficult to measure its thickness. And by the way, that's, you know, as I said, that's what I was working on as an undergraduate was much longer with the much longer waves, they penetrate. So you said that's what these sort of, they have all these methods now where they drag these, you can drag these instruments um, from helicopters and planes, but not up in satellites because it's just too long a wavelength, 100 megahertz. Okay, um, so, so the next big question then was, well, what, how does the permeability, you understand sort of the threshold, how does the permeability depend upon, um, the brine volume fraction and so on. So we then came uh, applied percolation theory, but again, you have to do it in the right way um, to uh, basically develop a theory for the permeability. So there's the 5%, there's the best known value for the, the critical exponent. And I did a lot of, actually that's my rigorous bound that it has to be less than or equal to two in three dimensions, that's kind of the upper bound. And then this amazingly, you'd think, oh yeah, that's just a fudge factor that they, that they, that they you know, did to fit the data, but no, this is actually something that we got from a, from a theory. So this is from, it was originally developed which we were unaware of critical path analysis and hopping conduction. Um, in other words, a theory that gives you the leading order behavior, the asymptotic behavior. Um, anyway, uh, it's a really fascinating story. And we figured this out with a Russian colleague of mine, we went through the, the coup against Gorbachev. And that's when we figured all this out um, in 1991, yeah. 
And uh, many years later, I then used it to get the leading order behavior of the fluid permeability um, in sea ice, because it was basically the whole theory is about bottlenecks, that bottlenecks control the flow. And so you get a sense from the X-ray tomography, you know, the scaling of the bottleneck. And then out pops this beautiful formula that captures all the, all the data. And finally, um, we were able to finally confirm this rule of buys, but that wasn't until 2009. So I observed it in 1994, it wasn't until 15 years later when we developed the mathematical technology and the X-ray tomography to confirm my, my intuition. Okay, so now this is all well and good, but how about if you have, if you have, if you have algae? If you got algae, one of the survival techniques that they use is to secrete what's called extracellular polymeric substances like algal goop. So to protect them from this, from this um, extreme environment with extreme variations in salinity and temperature. And so this is a picture of it. So there you see an algal cell like surrounded by his goop. And but this changes the microstructure from a log nor a classic log normal for the, so the, the cross-sectional areas of the brine inclusions to a bimodal. And so then one of my PhD students, he worked, you know, worked on this and did a big numerical model and also did rigorous bounds on the fluid permeability um, based on this uh, uh, an analytic expression for this bimodal. Uh, distribution. So anyway, so this is an interesting study because it's not the typical question in, in, in sea ice biology, how does the physics affect the biology? This is, well, how does the presence of the biology affect the physics? And we have some biological study, related biological studies going on right now. Okay, so this is, so measuring the permeability. So this was a photo that was taken that I had no idea was being taken. So this is me on the ice in Antarctica, I was actually taking the first measurements ever of fluid permeability in the Antarctic ice pack. And yeah, okay, this is the cover of the notice, this is the AMS. You think this is like big experiments, but in fact, these guys were playing soccer. That's so what I did. Anyway, um, okay. So the remote sensing problem. And so this is where you get into the sort of the all the electromagnetics. And this is fundamentally, it's an inverse problem. Namely, how do you recover sea ice properties? from uh, electromagnetic data, such as the effective uh, complex permittivity. We'd like to recover, say, grind volume fraction, the connectivity, the thickness, concentration, all the kind of things that you might expect. So um, basically, the, the setup that we use um, is, is a quasi-static limit. This is often the case with these submillimeter scale brine inclusion, certainly for these long wavelength methods for measuring the thickness, but also even, even typical um, when you have uh, several centimeter wavelengths, which is like microwaves, then you know, you're talking about still submillimeter scale bright inclusion. So you're in this quasi-static limit. So then these are the basic Maxwell, this is what Maxwell's equation is reduced to. This defines the effective complex permittivity. Um, it's a complicated function of the ratio of the complex permittivities of the brine and the ice, as well as of course the composite geometry. And then we're interested in what are the effective propagation characteristics of radar microwaves through the, through the medium. And so the method that, we, that we've really uh, uh, worked on a lot and that I, was, I worked on a lot in my, when I was a, a PhD student um, and developed independently by David Bergman in Israel, physicist in Israel, and Graham Milton, who was then a master's, uh, an undergraduate master's at University of Sydney in physics. And now but he's been at the University of Utah as a professor for, for many, many years now, since the, the mid 90s. And um, anyway, so these are, and these things are extremely powerful. You'll see that they're, they're almost, this is almost gonna be like a tour of the applications of Stilte's integral representations, the rest of the talk. You'll see it comes up in a lot of places. So here we have the homogenized parameter and um, we have this integral representation. And what's so powerful is, is the material parameters are encapsulated in this complex variable. For a two-phase material, we get analytic functions of several complex variables, which is what my thesis was really about, my PhD thesis, when you have multi-phase, more, more than two component materials. But anyway, for the two-phase case, brine and ice, then all the geometry is, in, is incorporated into this spectral measure, the spectral measure of a self adjoint operator gamma chi, uh, which, is, which depends only on the geometry, so that all the material stuff is in that complex variable, and all of the geometry 
is the connectedness, the inclusion sizes, all that information is rigorously incorporated into this operator. So gamma is gradient, inverse Laplacian divergence, the inverse Laplacian like convolution with the Green's function and appropriate boundary conditions if necessary. And this is where the randomness comes in. Chi is the characteristic function of the brine phase. And so the mass of the measure is the, is the brine volume fraction. It's higher moments depend on endpoint correlation functions. And the underlying mathematical structure that makes everything go is this resolvent representation for the electric field in terms of the average field. And, um, uh, and this is the same structure that you'll see in many different applications. So this operator gamma chi, I think of this as linking scales. It takes us from the micro scale in chi to the macro scale to the homogenized parameter. Okay. So this, from the point of view of physics, this representation distills the complexities of the mixture geometry into the spectral properties, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of an operator like the Hamiltonian physics. It's all there, there's a beautiful parallel. Okay, so we, we uh, back in the 1990s, the Office of Naval Research was really interested in uh, developing next generation inverse scattering algorithms for sea ice and I was very involved in all that research. And so we use these integral representations to get forward and inverse bounds, very tight bounds on complex permittivity of sea ice, inverse bounds to recover um, uh, brine porosity. But also uh, we were able to get rigorous information from complex permittivity data on the separation of the inclusions, which was very useful. And I believe even a first for the theory of composite materials, I believe. Okay. As I mentioned, you know, that we have these amazing applications to bone with this, with this spectral measure. So here's sea ice, here's bone, and here's our recovery from uh, electromagnetic data of, of uh, the, what the spectral measure looks like in these, two different in these two different cases. So this is young, healthy bone, and this is the spectral measure for old osteoporotic bone. And um, so what's, and from my point of view, again, the math doesn't care. If it's if it's sea ice or bone or or brain tissue or lung, you know, whatever. Okay, so we realized quite a while ago that um, if you could get your hands on this spectral measure, then then you really you really have your hands on most everything. In other words, you have all these different uh, conductivity, electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, complex permittivity, magnetic permeability, diffusion, all these proper different properties but they all have the same spectral measure because that's, that's determined by the geometry. So if you, if you can calculate that thing, then you know, you, you, you've really got your hands on something very powerful. And so the, the, the spectral measure, as I said, it depends on the composite geometry. If you discretize an image, it gives a binary network, basically like a random resistor network. And then the fundamental operator becomes a random matrix. And the spectral measure then can be computed directly from these eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, some earlier work had been done on this where they constructed the spectral measure, but like from the boundary values of an analytic function where they compute, where they do high resolution computations of the values of the function, but they don't get their hands on the spectral measure itself. They get it indirectly. So we kind of did it what I, I, I call the, you know, kind of the dumb way. In other words, this wasn't clever mathematics. It was just, well, here we have this operator. It's a matrix. Let's compute the matrix and compute its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I mean, of course, it's more complicated than that. But, and so then we, but then we could do statistics on the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and we found something very unexpected and amazing. So here's the classic random resistor network, uh, sparse, um, 0 0.3, 30%, 50%, that's the threshold. These are cal our calculations of the spectral measures. But what was so fascinating was we saw, we were able to calculate the, 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 the spacing, but statistically, the distributions of the spacings between eigenvalues. And so and you'll see this more dramatically in the next pictures, but we went from where they, they can pretty much do anything they want when you have lack of long range order. And as you develop a long range order and go to a percolation threshold, we converge to the so-called Wigner-Dyson um, universal distribution, in this case of the so-called Gaussian orthogonal ensemble that comes up in random matrix theory. So random matrix theory was begun in the 1950s by the physicists Wigner and Dyson, who first used looking at statistical behavior of eigenvalues of their Hamiltonian in the case of atomic physics. 
And so um, you can look at you know, unitary uh, matrices or orthogonal matrices. And then it turns out for our problem that um, uh, it's this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble that's relevant. And, but also fa fascinatingly, um, the distribution of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, namely you know, the Riemann hypothesis, um, they satisfy the GUE. So there's this interesting connection then of our, of our findings from CI structures with um, the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, so, so what we started to really find is, so now we're looking at the water phase in the sea ice pack, and we see that um, here are our calculations and spectral measures, and you see that when the, 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 the seawater phase connects, we have this big eigenvalue at zero. And anyway, but then what you really see, what's so fascinating is this is um, Poisson distributed, you know, no, no long range order, disconnected water, Poisson distributed eigenvalues can do whatever they want. And then you converge to, you have to have this, this repulsive level repulsion. It's like they behave like, they behave like electrons on the line where they, they want to you know, repel each other and not, 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 uh, not collect. And anyway, we realized that this was, that what we were seeing was part of a much richer picture of like basically all the physics of Anderson localization and Anderson transitions, but without the waves, which is kind of astounding. So in, in semiconductor physics and um, uh, basic and statistical physics, so if you look at electronic transport and semiconductors, there's this beautiful work of Anderson that he got the Nobel Prize for, that if you ramp up the disorder, the extended states localize and you, um, and you see these, uh, you go from where the, the, the eigenvalues are talking to each other because you have extended states of electronic states and you're in this so-called Wigner-Dyson universal um, uh, distribution and then you lose that and you go to the, the more the Poisson in any way. Um, so, but in, in, in the, the classic Anderson uh, uh, transition picture, comes up is due to scattering and interference effects and comes up in quantum, Schrodinger wave equation, optics, Maxwell's wave equation, acoustics, water rays, and so on. What's so striking about what we discovered is that we looked at spectral measures for, um, for brine, melt ponds, ice flows, these, these um, CI structures, and we found a, not disorder this way, but percolation-driven Anderson transition. And not for um, wave properties, but for uh, electrical thermal conductivity, diffusion, all these kinds of properties. And again, but with no wave interference or scattering effect. So we found this pretty striking. And this was published in Israel Letters a few years ago. And then, but then, um, I don't know, four, four or five years ago, some, uh, the, the son of somebody I was in Antarctica with on that expedition in 1994, his son was doing a PhD in physics here at Utah. And then he asked me to be his advisor. And so I had him start to work on this problem, but in a fascinating subset of, of area, namely where in quasi-periodic, quasi-periodic variation. And so this is something that I harked back to something I had done at Rutgers with Joel Leibowitz and Shelley Goldstein. And I talked about this in the mathematical physics seminar there. So we found something again, very unexpected. And this was all motivated by, by quasi crystals and Schrodinger operators at the time, looking at uh, spectral properties then. And so we looked at classical transport, like the effective conductivity um, for something like three plus cosin X plus cosin KX or a, or a two phase material in one dimension specified by a line of slope K through an infinite checkerboard. And what we found is, is that if you look at the effective conductivity, it's actually continuous at K rational, irra irrational, but discontinuous at K rational. In other words, this is like a graph of the homogenized parameter. So there's all kind of weird stuff going on in this interplay between periodicity, rational K, and quasi-periodicity. So then, but now going back to all this amazing random matrix theory, I thought, you know, there's gotta be something interesting here. And lo and behold, there really was. So this brilliant PhD student, um, David Morrison, constructed these moiré patterns where you like, there's this twist, you twist patterns, and you can get this wild variety of materials. 
and we see another Anderson transition. So this is like periodic, less periodic, and then uh, but we, we converge only through a two degree change in the twist angle of this moiré pattern, we get this incredible transition from periodic um, band gaps to um, behavior just like uh, a completely random disordered material in the random resistor network at its percolation threshold. And this is the parameter space. And these are, anyway, yellow is, um, yellow is uh, like Poisson distributed eigenvalues and the dark blue is the bigger dice and repulse. So you see this incredibly complex structure and underlying fractal structure in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the parameter space. And so what the, the takeaway here is kind of what we've done is we took the entire framework, but through our analysis of CI structures, we were able to make a parallel between the framework of solid state physics of electronic transport, quantum transport, band gaps and mobility engines and semiconductors, and put that on an equal footing with classical transport in periodic and quasi-periodic systems. And again, this is one of the spin-offs of our sea ice work. Okay, so, um, so sea ice, again, I mentioned is a polycrystalline material, and we're also interested in homogenizing that, given information about the, the, the individual crystals and then their statistics. And so we got rigorous bounds. This was another PhD student, rigorous bounds on uh, the effect of complex primitivity, forward and inverse bounds. Um, and, uh, and, the, and one of the main ideas here ultimately is to distinguish between so-called grand, fine grain granular ice and columnar ice, because they have very different um, fluid uh, percolation properties. As you see here, um, there's a uh, this is a paper we're working on that I you know, hadn't been finished for about eight years or something, but finally getting to it. And that is the 5% threshold in columnar sea ice but then um, uh, say a 10%, a much higher threshold in um, granular, uh, more granular microstructure. Okay, from the mesoscale, we're very interested in waves propagating through this composite structure. And uh, another finished uh, PhD student finished a couple of years ago, uh, adapted this whole Stilchus framework to long wavelength ocean waves propagating and got the first theoretical bounds on the effective complex viscoelasticity, which prior to our work had only been fitted to, to, to data to get information on that, on that key um, coefficient. Okay, another large area where we have a lot of work going on is so-called advection diffusion processes, where um, say nutrient salt transport by fluids as well as diffusion heat transport with fluid components. Um, sea ice flows uh, in winds and currents, the, the ice flows diffuse and then they're also um, uh, being advected. So here's the classic advection diffusion equation. We homogenize that. And then there's an effective diffusivity. Um, and so uh, Marco Villaneda and Andy Maida many years ago, based on my PhD work with George Papanicolau, they adapted our functional analytic framework to getting uh, rigorous bounds and a Stilchy's representation for the effective uh, uh, convection enhanced or advection enhanced diffusivity. But then we've followed up on that many years later um, with, a, with a, as you see the papers at the bottom. And here's actually some of the, 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 the fluid flow fields from my tracer experiments that you see um, in these sea ice blocks. And so this is a paper, we, a, a monster paper we published finally in Journal of Mathematical Physics last year. Um, where it's sort of a slightly different version of these, these integral representations, the, all the basic theory, and then um, a rigorous framework for numerical computations of the spectral measures, as well as effective diffusivity, and a whole theory of uh, how do you calculate the moments, like for sea ice microstructures and so on. Um, and, um, and then, so we get then bounds on sort of thermal conductivity in the presence of of convection. And so we have a whole lot of work here on this advection diffusion problem. And again, exploiting these Stilchy's integral representations. And then another, one of the things we've been most involved with on the meso scale is these melt ponds. Because as you know, that as I mentioned, they're very important. They have very interesting geometry. And um, I wanted to ask, well, are there universal features of the evolution similar to phase transitions in statistical physics? Um, although there had been a lot of, um, sort of you know, complicated numerical models that have all the physics 
including our results on permeability. But I wanted to kind of step back because to me, this looked like a fractal and nobody had really asked that question. And so just to remind you of fractal, so here's um, say uh, these simple Euclidean curves in one dimension, um, uh, start to bend it up the Koch snowflake, fractal dimension 1.26, and the most you can have in two dimensions, they wiggle so much that it's a, a, you have a fractal dimension of two, like Brownian motion. So motivated by um, area perimeter relations, exploited by Lovejoy for clouds, who found a fractal dimension about 1.35 for clouds, I thought we'd find something similar. But what we found was a transition in the fractal dimension of the melt ponds through analysis of hundreds of thousands of ponds and their area perimeter data. So you start out at one, these very simple ponds, they start to complexify and become really complex with boundaries that are behaving like space filling curves with a fractal dimension close to two. And so we've been coming up with models to try to understand this and explain this. And um, so here's a random surface. And this was led by uh, uh, one of my great undergrads who I uh, started working with in his freshman year in my Cal, from my Calc 3 class. And so as you just uh, lower or raise up the, um, the interface, then you get these beautiful melt pond looking pictures. And then we can actually study the fractal dimension as a, uh, and how that depends on the statistical parameters that describe the, the random snow surface. And then another, but then we also asked, well, how, how, do you, how do you get this fractal dimension evolution? And then so another student of mine looked at um, uh, uh, saddle points. It, it turns out when, when ponds connect up through saddle points, the, a proxy for the fractal dimension, namely the isoparametric quotient, the square of the perimeter over the four pi times the area jumps. And that's what actually drives the transition. And this was done by Riley Moore, um, a graduate student here. And, and so there was this mosaic graduate school. So the, the, one of the things that just ended was the largest Arctic expedition ever in history. And they were drifted through the Arctic ice pack for a year. And the first leg of that was a graduate school. And Riley was the only, there were only three graduate students invited from the US and Riley was, but Riley was the only student in the world from a math department that was invited to, uh, to go on this. And she actually deployed a really complicated buoy for a colleague of mine. And it was pretty amazing what she, what she did. So one of the, the um, models that we're most excited about is this easing model. So um, the classic easing model was uh, developed 100 years ago to describe how materials gain and lose magnetism. You have a lattice of spin, spin up, spin down. Here's the, uh, how they interact with an applied magnetic field. They only interact with their nearest neighbors and you're interested in the magnetization. But to low, they, they, they want to align with each other to, for ferromagnetic to lower energy. And it, so what I, one of the things I observed was, gee, you know, these, the magnetic domain pictures that I used to stare at in statistical physics classes, gee, it looked just like melt ponds, you know? And um, so then I realized, well, and I, I don't know, this, instead of spin up, spin down, how about melt water and ice? And, you know, because also the melt water wants to hang out together, you know, in, in, these, little, in these little troughs of the snow topography which to minimize the energy. And so we came up with this, you know, toy, Hamiltonian for an easy model for melt ponds. And, and then the magnetization, the order parameter is basically connected to the key thing here, namely the albedo, the area fraction. And then starting with random initial configurations as the Hamiltonian energy is minimized by so-called blob or spin flip dynamics, the system flows toward metastable equilibria. And so these are kind of our results. I mean, to my eye, you know, here's our easy model and here's the real melt ponds. And we match right up with the uh, the, the, the predicted fractal dimension, as well as the, the critical exponent that describes the sizes. And what's amazing is there's only one input parameter, and that's how do you relate the side, the grid size to the physical snow, you know, the, the, the physical space. And we just use some power spectrum analysis. It tells it should be one meter, and then everything matches up. It was kind of amazing with just that one um, uh, measured parameter. Okay, so these melt ponds, they control the transmittance of solar energy through the ice and into the upper ocean. They act like windows. And so one of the fascinating things that seems to have happened recently is um, the appearance of not blooms of algae out in the open ocean, but blooms of algae underneath the ice. 
And I was lucky enough to go on an Arctic expedition in 2014 to kind of look at this and study melt ponds. And um, anyway, but one of the fascinating things that came out of this was uh, to look at uh, the frequency and extent of phytoplankton blooms with the new kind of in the new Arctic, as well as um, the distribution of of like, you know, from the ponding and the fractal geometry, how does the fractal geometry of the ponds affect the distribution of light in the upper ocean? Okay, finally, the last little piece here, before I show you the video then, is, is um, another this problem on the macro scale. So here's like a big swath of the Arctic Ocean. GPS data on ice flows, um, you know, looks like Brownian in motion. However, you can have purely diffusive, subdiffusive, or super diffusive, depending on the conditions of the ice pack and the advective forcing. And so there was a beautiful paper that, that I was an editor on um, that, I, that you know, got me interested in this problem on sea ice dynamical regimes in the Arctic Ocean. So I had a PhD student who's now at, at Courant um, Institute, uh, basically to make a develop a flow scale model of this and try to understand how these Super diffusion, subdiffusion, anomalous diffusion depends on crowding, jamming, and the advective forcing. And I should mention that there's a lot of really interesting studies on polar bears diffusing on the ice pack. And I have, an, I have a freshman working on something like this right now about optimal foraging strategies for polar bears. And, um, and but then there, but then the ice pack is diffusing as well. So it's like a double diffusion. Anyway, okay. Um, one of the, the really big scale problems is this so-called marginal ice zone. So this is basically where biologically active, it's where waves are, and it's where intense ocean ice atmosphere interactions. One way to define it is you've got this, in, in the Arctic, you've got this inner core, sea ice concentration bigger than 80%, but then you go from 80% down to 15%. And so this sinuous, highly dynamic region called the marginal ice zone. It's a great interest because it's also, it's a fundamental length scale. The width is a fundamental length scale of ecological and climate dynamics. But how do you measure its width? You know, it's tiny here, thick here. What, you know, how do you do that? And so my colleague, Court Strong in Atmospheric Sciences, he came up with this fantastic, beautiful mathematical idea to assume that it's a harmonic function, that it solves Laplace's equation, which is not crazy because that's the steady state heat equation anyway. Um, from 8.8 .8 boundary conditions down to 0.15. And then you get these streamlines. Those are the electric fields. And you just go around the whole thing and you measure it. So you get a, an objective measure of the width by going around and measure all the lengths of the streamlines. And then they discovered that there's been about a 40% widening over the satellite era as the climate has warmed. And this is the same method that they use to measure the thickness of the cerebral cortex of a rat brain, which I find interesting. Okay, so the last little thing here then is this, this hole that I mentioned at the very beginning. So it used to be really big. And anyway, so we came up with this method to take a harmonic function. Again, makes sense physically, but then uh, a learned stochastic term where you, you sample the stochastic variations around it. And anyway, in the uh, NSIDC, National Snow Ice and Data Center, as well as the Norwegian Meteorological Institute, they're all interested in using our PDE method we're filling the data gap in order to update the climate record. Okay, so then in conclusion, sea ice is this fascinating multi-scale material that has structure, it's very similar to other natural and man-made materials. Um, and, but, you know, from our perspective as mathematicians, many of these, we can, you know, uh, take many of these methods from other areas and bring them to bear on sea ice and vice versa. And in particular, it's homogenization and statistical physics that are really well suited to the composite structure um, and complex statistical structure of, of sea ice. And ultimately we're trying to advance uh, sea ice, how sea ice is represented in climate models. In particular, this problem of fluid flow for the sea ice um, mel uh, mediates melt pond evolution, as well as a lot of critical processes. And from my perspective, you know, I think it's important to get down there and see things. It's certainly changed the course of my career you know, going beyond sitting in your office and trying to imagine how a complex system works, but um, to go down there and see it and experiment with it. And ultimately, our research is helping to improve projections of climate change, the fate of our Earth's ice packs, as well as these uh, rich ecosystems they support. And so I wanted to thank a whole lot of students, postdocs, undergrads, and high school students 
um, who have been involved in this research as co-authors and uh, anyway, but also I wanted to mention there was a, 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 an overview article that we had in the notices of the American Mathematical Society back in the November issue. Um, also this easing model was in uh, Siam News. There's our picture of the easing model and so on. And uh, and thanks to off Research and the National Science Foundation and lots of other governments for funding this research. And so with that, I'm gonna actually remind you that the video I'm gonna show you, you know, this is from an Antarctic expedition. And the first time I went with the Australians, we had been out in the ice for, you know, just, just gotten in the ice pack, 2.45 in the morning, the alarms are blaring, please don't be alarmed, but we have an uncontrolled fire in the engine room. And so I'm thinking, you know, God, I'm a, you know, I prove theorems for a living. What in the world am I doing on a burning ship in Antarctica? So anyway, um, you know, with that, unless there's anything, you know, that you want to ask right now or whatever, I'll, you know, I'll be, I'll be glad to uh, sort of, you know, show you the, show you the video. So uh, Melinda, should I just go right into the video then? And... Yes, yes, please. Okay, great, great. So let me stop sharing this. Whoops. Okay. All right, let me get this so you can. Whoops. Okay, can you see that all? Or yeah, can you? Do you see the, Do you see it? Oh, Melinda, can you see? Because I can't see anybody anymore. Can you see it yes. now? Yes. Great. Okay. So, great. So here. So this is uh, the sea ice physics and ecosystem experiment two. The first one was I think seven years, uh, five years before 2005. So this is just some initial eye candy, trying to show you what it's like to be go down to Antarctica. Here's some of the local inhabitants. This is my $10,000 carbon fiber borer to get extract sea ice cores. Welcome back. A professor of mathematics and two grad students from the University of Utah are preparing for a hazardous two-month mission to Antarctica. Well, why do they need so mathematicians the in Antarticus? Science and nature specialist. Why do they need Holland mathematicians in Live with you right now with the answer, John. Well, they're heading out in about two weeks. They'll be shipping out on a uh, on an Australian icebreaker that's steaming out of Tasmania. For one of these math whizzes, this is his 15th trip to the polar regions. Yes, he'll be crunching the numbers as well as crunching the ice. So this is uh, getting ready for our expedition in the home port of the Aurora, which is Hobart, Tasmania. It's a great town. No, the island off the southern coast of Australia. So this is crossing the Southern Ocean. It was pretty calm on the way down. And now we're entering the marginal ice zone. And here you see sort of just a very calm, beautiful morning. The ocean, the, the waves are amazing. The high frequencies are all uh, damped out and they break up the ice. So this is what it's like down on the ice with these big waves. So you see the whole ice scape in front of you undulating. It's an amazing phenomenon. What do we have here? What are you trying to do? Uh, wave boys. So this is an applied mountain position. Yeah, I can see us in Antarctica. And the idea is to measure the wave decay. Uh, Cause we're interested in how the wave energy propagates in sea ice and how that affects the breakup of the sea ice and sea ice melt therefore. And our sea ice plays a quite a big role in the climate system and um, if we can predict how it breaks up and how it melts and how it grows then we can improve the climate models basically. What did you study as an undergraduate? Uh, mathematics. What did you do your PhD in? Uh, it was applied mathematics PhD um, studying wave scattering in sea ice. So what's been your favourite part of being, of being down here? I like to say the waves but that makes me a bit seasick. <laughs> <laughs> So this is setting up our first ice station and it all looks nice and unbroken and looks so nice, but there are waves, as I said, that we're in the marginal ice zone. There are waves going through here and these penguins came toward us. And so I was one of the safety officers and I saw the whole ice moving up and down like it was breathing and I called in and they called everybody back 
but it was too late for the people that were stuck on the wrong side of the crack. And so, but then we deployed this um, uh, this ice this bridge, which had never never been done before in time that I knew of. And anyway, so this then they got across and got their equipment back. But then we had to go back out and try to rescue some of the other equipment. And then this is what happened there. The whole thing broke apart. And so fortunately, we had gotten on. And there's those penguins off in the distance to the right, sort of laughing at us. So this is what the oceanographers use yeah, to measure. Yeah, remotely operated uh, vehicle. It's interesting that it's five cameras, so we can look at the substance of the ice, look at the physical the features, but also can observe the biology. And it, my instrument or the main goal is really to measure under ice irradiance or transmitted sunlight and the color composition of it, which tells us how much algae there are in the ice. So we're working on algorithms or equations to relate biomass chlorophyll, which is a proxy for algae biomass in ice, with, with the amount of light. So the penguins would get scared by this 300 foot long large ship. So this is our team going in. It takes about two hours to get ready to, you know, haul all this, get the stuff ready. So that's Christian and, and David. Um, and this is me shoveling snow to get to the ice surface for our permeability measurements. Here I am doing some of our, our measurements at night. Uh, these are these partial holes to measure the fluid permeability. Coming up on it. While I while I break it with this very specially chosen instrument, <laughs> this bamboo pole. So, the core is supposed to get the cores, but we, I, we had to develop now, this lasso this method to get them. Beautiful, perfect core. And so then we measure the rate at which the water fills in a partial like hole. Doing to get the perk and back out, out of the ice. Holes. Got a pressure tra transducer down here, and then we have one that sits in the atmosphere as well. And by seeing what pressure it actually experiences compared to the outside air, we can tell how much water is actually in the hole. So this is reservoir technology that we adapted to get the pressure of the water, to measure the height of the water in the, in the hole. And these are the seals. that we're going to put in this wave guide to do a microwave measurement. So this is some of our electromagnetic measurements. We're always being uh, visited by, by penguins and seals. This is working in the freezer, looking for doing crystallographic got, analysis. Uh, the top of the ice, which you can see these sort of round crystal grains. Then there's a transition at about 20 centimeters, where we see it still looking fairly granular uh, or like snow ice, but we start to see it turn into columnar ice. So that's a little Adeli penguin. And then a much bigger emperor joins joins us. Then we take the party back in the back on the ship. And that penguin can do integrals as well. It was just astounding. So this was springtime in the Antarctic. So the primary objective is to really get a good assessment of the full 3D topography of the underside of the sea ice. This is all going to feed back towards the holy grail of the sea ice world in terms of being able to monitor and assess things like sea ice thickness from remote sensing packages like satellites. The holy grail, sea ice thickness. So this is now an AUV, not, not connected, not tethered surface. You can see the aurora on the left there. It's a big propeller. So this is some of the math that goes into uh, inverting for that bottom surface from upward looking sonar measurements. Some fluid dynamics looking out over the bow of the, of the aurora. So this is doing some laser scans of the snow surface and a famous CI scientist, Gerhard Diekmann. And now the aurora looks like, like a the Pirates of the Caribbean like a ghost ship. Who knew the penguins slapped each other? And then here on the left, there's the disapproving mom. <laughs> so that's a minky whale. They're pretty benign. The Antarctic supply ship Aurora Australis is stuck in heavy ice. 
The icebreakers, 1,600 nautical miles southwest of Hobart, close to Casey Station. Mathematics is not we a career path for someone who wants high adventure in remote parts of the globe, like Antarctica, but it's turned out that way for University of Utah math professor Ken Golden. The media in Australia are reporting that the 50 scientists are in no danger, waiting for the weather to change. In fact, they're taking advantage of the situation, helicoptering off the ship to do studies. So there you can see the radars underneath that we use for our electromagnetic vector. So this was this was Halloween, and there you see there there right in the middle there's a an alien that was probably the first full blown Halloween party on this Antarctic Sea Ice Pack. This is the we were so stuck the whale got stuck. That whale was there for the whole day. That's the whale. That we were in ice that was you know, one meter thick, but it, it can, it, it gets all jumbled up. So it was, it was like 20 meters. It was like 60 feet thick. It took two days of backing and ramming to get through that little 800 uh, meter wide swamp of, uh, of ice to get to that lead. So this is a raw seal and her pop. Again, this is springtime. And so we were really late. At this point, we were already, I think, about two weeks late. The ship has to supply the bases, and so we really just booked it back to Hobart. Um, what, this was amazing. That's a leopard seal, a top predator in um, massive waves, rolling waves in the marginal ice. So this was one of the greatest days of my life. Hurricane force storm in the Southern Ocean. It was just so impressive, so amazing. What these 20, 30, 40 foot waves would do to this ship. Wait, yeah, this was just, it's just getting thrown around like a, mat, a matchbook. So I was down the lower left. That's where I went to do some filming, but I was not supposed to be there because the person getting sucked out on less than half the end. So anyway, that's what I was looking at. And I did get kind of nailed with a wave right there, and I got pretty soaked, but at least I stayed on the ship. So then we arrived back in Hobart um, on a beautiful, uh, beautiful rainbow filled morning. And uh, so, anyway, this is just all the thanks to all the people who were involved in all the video that I used for to produce this, um, this chronicle of our, of our trip. And so, so with that, I, I, I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I, I certainly hope, uh, hope, hope you enjoyed it. So, and I'll stop sharing in just a, just a second. There we go. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for this. Uh amazing presentation and for the very exciting video. So I think it's the first time that I see a movie about an expedition to the Antarctic. <laughs> very, very nice. Um, so uh, do you prefer uh, your work as a mathematician or uh, do you prefer to go on expeditions? That's a, that's a really, it's, it's different. It satisfies different parts, you know? Um, so I, uh, I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything, and they've certainly shaped my mathematical career without a doubt. But then again, um, I don't think that I would have enjoyed, well, I'm sure I would have enjoyed it, but if I had simply gone down that early road that maybe I was headed in to become a classical geos geoscientist, um, I don't think, I don't think that um, uh, I would have enjoyed it as much being on this kind of this bound, this border, you know, having this very mathematical side, but also um, this um, side of, you know, wanting to actually measure things uh, in their, in their native, in their natural environment, you know, so, so it's really, it's really hard to say. For me, they're, both sides are really fundamental. Yes, indeed, and then you are able to enjoy both sides, so I think um, very few scientists can, can do the same, right? Yeah, I mean, it yeah. took a lot of, you know, I, I, because I never, I've never even taken a course in sea ice. I mean, I have no training in any of this. This is all just sort of stuff I've had to figure out. And how do you, 
how do you, you know, um, pull off an Antarctic expedition, bringing people down there, bringing, you know, half a ton of scientific mm. equipment and all the kinds of experiments. So if anything goes wrong, you can make sure it still works and, and so on. But, you know, doing that in a math department. So many of my colleagues, you know, they're in geoscience departments and they have entire, you know, like half a department that's devoted to, mm. to doing that kind of stuff, to providing the infrastructural support and logistical support. And so, you know, so that's been a real challenge, you know, mm. doing this in math, but I've had a lot of great support, you know, in our department and through my and the university. So, um, and it, also a lot of colleagues around the world, of course. Is it difficult to gather funding for, for expeditions as a mathematician? Um, I've, I've been able to, you know, kind of walk, uh, not, not particularly math, but I'd say the math world has been very supportive. You know, for example, we had a five year um, math that some of you may have known about, a five year, very large um, NSF grant to establish a math climate research network with Chris Jones, um, who some of you may know. And I guess I saw you had Michael, G no, my, Michael wasn't involved directly, but um, uh, let's see. So this was at 12 hubs across the U S and, um, uh, and I did have specific money for expeditions, you know, for bringing and, and, uh, you know, for bringing students to the, I guess in, in particular to the Arctic in that, in that case. But, um, and so I would say that, you know, however, I've had a very close relationship with the Australians. And so that has made it um, very, you know, relatively easy that I, it's not like, oh, I have to go out and get a big grant um, to participate in this. And, you know, and, and, and for example, you know, but we have had funding where, you know, from, from uh, I guess, jointly, say from math and with polar programs. So, you know, we've tried to walk this fine line and it is not, it has not been particularly difficult, you know, to obtain funding for, to do what we need to do. You know. Great. Uh, it's, it was also very nice to see uh, in your presentation this, how you call it, cross-pollinization, that uh, like uh, different disciplines, uh, the results of different disciplines can be combined and can be used and um, in, a, in a very productive way. So that was very nice. And I think it's also very nice to see how you involve all those undergraduate students and graduate students and uh, like researchers on, on many different levels of their mm -hmm. career into really doing research and doing these amazing things. So yeah, that's, that, that's been great. I mean, I've been extremely lucky to have, I mean, at this point, I have another one just, you know, literally just started with, um, I've had now 11 high school students and, you know, but, but each one of them, it's kind of like, if I could have only been like that when I was in high school, you know, these kids are, they're just literally off the charts. These are like 10th and 11th graders who are taking, you know, advanced number theory at the university level and abstract <laughs> algebra and you know this kind of stuff and it's like you just can't even believe how how advanced some of these these kids are and then i you know i've had such good luck also with undergraduates that's one of the main reasons i teach introductory calculus classes is to get these really taught some of these top students um, who are really want to be involved in research but also from many different departments you know so that's been a, a very and then to and then to you know, get them really involved in this kind of work and take them to the Arctic. You know, it, that changes people's lives when they it's, have those kinds of immersive, transformative experiences. Okay. Yes, great. Um, we have no questions from the, the, the audience, but Leslie would like to, do you have a question, Leslie? Yes. Uh, yeah, I cannot write in the Q&A for some reason, so I'll just ask it live. So uh, it was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, and I was wondering, are the, have the algae evolved to reduce this uh, critical value? And so can we learn from, can we learn from biology in this case to design materials? Oh yeah, that's, re that's really interesting. And I, I don't have a real answer for that if they, if, if they, well, they definitely changed the, you know, the, the presence of the, the EPS, it does two things. It clogs up pores, I think. And also, um, it changes the geometry. You know, it's more fractally, um, and so uh, so it does change the fluid permeability characteristics of the sea ice. No, no question. Um, exactly how that happens, or if it really changes the threshold—that's a great question that I haven't really thought about. 
And I don't really know if we have such precise, are able to make such precise measurements like that, you know, yet. Um, you know, one of the, the really interesting aspects also is this under ice, the under ice blooms, you know, um, and what's going on there? Has that really, has that always existed? Did we only just find this out in 2011? Or is it really like, uh, we've, we've just changed the melt pond distribution, you know, now there's just, we just reached a critical amount, amount of light, you know, and it's critical amount of thinning, you know, or whatever, that you just reach some sort of critical, some critical parameter, you know, where it's like, oh, wow, now you start getting blue, these massive blooms that literally look like pea soup, you know, green pea soup, you know, because it was so thick of algae. So, you know, that's, that's another really interesting evolutionary question. Have, you know, is this something really new? Is this something that was there before, just not very frequent or, you know, anyway, so, so yeah, those, those are, those are really, those are really, really interesting questions. And we, we have a, a fair number of studies now um, going on, on, you know, basically uh, trying to understand this subtle interplay between, between the physics of the ice and the microstructure and the dynamics of these microbial communities that live there. Uh, yes, uh, to our attendees, uh, you still have a couple of minutes to ask questions if you would like to. Um, I, was, I was wondering, I think I didn't understood it um, uh, very well. So the, the universality, you were mentioning uh, universality, and this comes into the picture because uh, the, the eyes starts to behave like a random matrix, right? Okay, there's, there's two different, actually there, I was not clear about that. There's two different kinds of universality. The one that I usually talk about is the universality of the critical exponent that describes the fluid permeability or the electrical conductivity. So in lattice models, um, you, have, you have universality. In other words, the permeability or the conductivity takes off above the threshold with a, with a critical exponent, you know, that, that describes the asymptotic behavior near the threshold. And that in lattice models, that's believed to be universal in the sense that any lattice model in two dimensions, they all, they all have the same value if there are two dimensions. Doesn't matter if it's a triangular lattice, the square lattice, whatever. And then you have a different value in three dimensions. And, um, uh, but then, however, one of, so one of the big hurdles that we had, you know, 15 years ago was, well, in continuum materials, there were these beautiful results of, in, in, in mathematical phys, in, in PhysRev letters of uh, Halperin, Bert Halperin at Harvard, there's all these condensed matter theorists, and they would look at these things, and they, they developed the so-called Swiss cheese model, which was the first real example of, of non-universal non critical exponents. So my first, one of my first jobs was, oh, well, sea ice is clearly a continuum material. Does it behave like, is it within the universality class of lattice models, or is it some crazy continuum material? Because we wanted to predict that exponent. Anyway, I then, it turns out that because of the log normal distribution of the sizes of the inclusions, it's not a rigorous theorem, but numerically, it turns out that you're in the, you're in the, the, the classic universal lattice case. And lo and behold, you know, that's what we predict. We, you know, we have an argument for that. And when we use that with all the other nice values like these, like that uh, critical path analysis for the leading coefficient, it all works out very beautifully. Where we subtly take into account the continuum aspect through the, through the leading order coefficient, but not the, not the, the critical exponent. Okay. Then there's, so now that's the, that's transports. So and then there's a whole other issue of the fractal properties of the melt ponds and the brine and the brine phase. And so then we're talking about, you know, this operator becoming a matrix. It's a random medium. So it's a random matrix. It has random characteristics, not like the classic ones. It's not like you're choosing the coefficients of the matrix from a Gaussian distribution. It's far more complicated than that through the percolation structure and so on. And, um, and then, now you have, now you just, you know, have the appearance of these so-called universal distributions that describe the eigenvalue spacings. So where you go from sort of Poisson uncorrelated to where they start to repel each other as you develop long range order and the eigenvectors start talking to each other where the fields, you know, are extended. And so the eigenstates 
communicate with each other and they want to like, I guess, stay away from each other in their, in their energies and their, they're not really energies, but in their, in their eigenvalues. So, so there's two different notions of universality. here. And um, anyway, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Yeah, well, it's interesting to see that uh, you can get universality also in case of uh, correlations, basically, right? Like in, if you have this yes. um, quite strong correlation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I was wondering, did you had the chance to, to Im based on your fi uh, findings, to improve uh, some climate model? Or yes. Yeah. So. Um, one, one direct route is, so all of our, our permeability results, so those were used in some of these initial parameterizations of melt ponds, because that's, again, that's one of the, the key things that determining everything is the permeability of the ice. And, um, and so though the, our results were then incorporated into these parameterizations, which are now in the most widely used um, sea ice component that goes into the big global climate models. So it's sort of like the big global climate models, they have ocean packages, atmosphere packages, ice packages, and so on. And then they have to, you know, meld them all together and work, you know, smoothly together. But so the one out of Los Alamos called CICE, -C um, it used to be, I think, Earth System. Well, there was also NCAR, but yeah, that was, that's right. That was the larger one. But anyway, so um, uh, my colleagues in, in the UK, like Danny Feltham and those who did a lot of the original numerical work on melt pond evolution. They used our results on, perme on permeability, our theoretical formulas to, um, the, you know, as key components of their melt pond parameterizations, which then really improve um, these, you know, these kind of models. But also now we're working with um, that same group at Los Alamos to kind of look at our e what our easing models might say, because they, they, they don't really track, they do not track where the meltwater is. And that's what we do. You know, we're interested in the, the geometry of how the meltwater is distributed. And, and, you know, and there hasn't, there hasn't been that much. There's a one, only one other real serious paper sort of on this about a, uh, a percolation type of approach. Um, so, but I would expect that, you know, over the next five years or so, that, you know, some, of, some more of this makes its way into, uh, into the sea ice components of climate models as well as our, our wave stuff, because waves are being incorporated in. And as I said, we have the only rigorous results on sort of this, the only, the only theoretical results at all that I know of on this uh, homogenization calculations for the complex physical elasticity of the ice pack as long waves are propagating through there. Hmm. So. Yeah, really, really uh, great research. Um, so we still have no questions from the audience. Um, probably your movie was so exciting that everyone <laughs> forgot about their questions. Uh, yeah, since it's uh, for us, it's already four, and for you, I think it's eight, right? Eight a.m. Yeah. So I think that uh, we should we should then close the seminar. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for this amazing talk and for getting up so early for uh, for us. And no problem. Really thank great. you for inviting me. Really. Yes, it was